Good morning, everyone. And Laura, thank you very much for the ride. I much appreciate it. Um, I'll bring you back, too. Thank you. That's <laughs> I won't tell everybody where you parked when you drop me off. Um, secrets that we have, as old friends often do. Um, and Gail, thank you so much for reaching out and inviting me here to your ride. Um, I'm thrilled to be here this morning and to be part of your visioning process and to uh, learn from all of you uh, about what you're thinking. Um, as Laura mentioned, I'm working on a bunch of different things, but in some respects, to me, the most important aspect of uh, what I'm working on in research and in uh, administration at Harvard is rethinking our learning communities broadly, rethinking um, the way in which we are uh, trying to redesign our library system, um, but also how we're thinking about pedagogy and research and how those things actually all fit together. So I think the frame that you have established for this 2020 visioning process is completely perfect. Um, it seems to me that the four questions that you're asking after this uh, um, plenary session are awesome, and I'll hit on some aspects of all of them as we go. Um, but I think uh, fundamentally, um, this is a conversation that can't just happen at one school. This is fundamentally a conversation that has to happen across many universities. And um, in particular, I think doing it in this way where we're affirmatively trying to chart a future, affirmatively trying to figure out what are the future of our libraries, what are the future of our classrooms, what's the future of our research institutions broadly. Um, so the invitation from Gail was one that I couldn't imagine uh, not taking up. Good morning, sir. How are you? Um, so I actually start in my own thinking about this question of learning communities by looking at this image. Um, I direct a library, so I love having an image collection that you can pull fun things from. Um, you have no reason to know what this is, but this is the personal study of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who was one of our graduates and a professor at Harvard Law School before going to the Supreme Court. Um, and this was his study, his personal study in Washington, D.C., when he was on the court. Um, and you can disagree with some of his opinions and some of what he did, but overall, he was totally brilliant, and he broke open the field of law in lots of important ways. Um, and this image, to me, uh, is evocative of a really attractive teaching and learning space, an, an environment where I want to sit and try to think great thoughts. I am no Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. by any stretch of the imagination, but this, to me, is an inspiring environment, a place to sit um, and a place to learn. Um, but I'm also completely aware at this moment that for our students, this is not so obviously the place to sit and learn, right? Um, we are uh, teaching a group of students, um, and to some extent ourselves as faculty, where we don't necessarily sit in a dedicated learning space like this, a beautiful environment, where we look to things on the wall, which in some cases actually are social signals, and in fact might be more props in some environments than actual uh, learning objects. Um, I know from my own students that our library is completely full all the time, our law library. It's a big library, and it's totally full. Um, students are there elbow to elbow, so much so during exams that we have to keep out the undergraduates, much to the chagrin of the FAS dean. I know your arts and sciences dean is here. I met her earlier. Um, so it's, it's full, but the students are not. I've never once seen a student do the following thing, which is walk up to a stack, pull a book down, and open it. Not once in four years of being a library director. It's just not the pattern of what our students are doing. It's not to say students don't read books. I'll get to that in a minute. But in terms of the pattern of what they're doing in these spaces is they're there because it's a social space to study. It's a quiet, contemplative space. It has good Wi-Fi. They have their laptops there. Now, they also have case books there. In my case, um, the students have uh, their law case books, so they're, they're using physical text because they like to underline and highlight and so forth. Um, but it's really fundamentally different, I think, than sitting alone in solitude in a space where you've brought all the knowledge to you in terms of how they're learning. So it seems to me the challenge for us as we're visioning 2020 in institutions like URI and Harvard is to think through what affirmatively do we want? How do we want to replace that kind of learning environment, whether it's in the context of a uh, library or uh, other kinds of learning spaces? Um, so my research in this area has been focused mostly on kids. I've been looking at the question of how young people, particularly those somewhere between 13 and 22-ish uh, in different uh, slices, uh, spend their time and make the argument that both the media that they're using and they themselves, in a sense, are born digital. These are kids who were born in an era where they didn't know something that was before this digital era. So they didn't have a sense of the analog world that we lived in before. Um, it's not to say that they do everything digitally, um, but they do a lot of things digitally. Um, I think one way to think about it is the amount of time they spend connected to these devices. When we ask kids about their way in which they are 
um, going through life and accessing information, um, they almost always tell us they have some internet connected device on their body at that moment. And I find even for myself that if I don't have it, I feel disconnected or something, right? I'm lost if I don't have it. So one of the key things is this incredibly connected life that they have and the extent to which they are almost always engaging with information in one another through these means. I think it's good and bad in lots of ways. I have um, criticisms of it, to be sure. Um, but one, I think, important thing is that um, even during interstitial moments, even sitting on a bus or waiting for a class to start, uh, we all probably were doing it. I know that the vice provost was reading the New York Times as she was waiting uh, for this to start. We all spend these interstitial moments learning in these ways. So it's just a very different environment, I think, than one where we went to special purpose-built learning environments at special moments to do our learning. It's not to say we don't do that too, but there's a very different sense of connectivity. Um, and it's not particularly evenly distributed. I think one of the big themes you're going to hit in one of your breakouts is this idea about digital literacies. So one of the things we found from this research is that these kids who are in uh, the kind of cohort we're studying have huge variability in terms of their digital um, abilities, their digital literacies. So it ranges from kids who are very naive about these technologies to kids who are very sophisticated. Um, and one of the things that the studies show consistently, our studies and others, is that it breaks down along socioeconomic lines. So there's a very strong SES skew to the most sophisticated to naive. So just as we think, that these are born digital or digital native kids, we have to be really aware that it's not evenly distributed. That in fact, the students who are coming to us have a wide range of these skills. And if we're not actually bringing people up that um, ladder, we're actually potentially driving um, further um, divisions within society. So I think when you focus on literacies, not treating everybody who comes into the environment um, as uh, the same uh, is a really important. Um, and last, I think it's really important to recognize uh, the extent to which these digital literacies matter according to lots of different disciplines. So I would bet that in the pharmacy school and in faculty of arts and sciences and um, in you know, your new chemistry building, there are different ways in which digital literacies are going to matter. Um, one of the things that I've found in our work to rethink the Harvard library system is how differently the different disciplines think about digital materials and digital learning. So I suspect you see this too within your um, system. Uh, very much uh, we see a divide between those who are doing the harder sciences who basically say we want nothing in our libraries but electronic journals. We see the data of circulation going unbelievably far down. Um, whereas in the humanities and uh, in some of the other parts of arts and sciences, there's still a huge reliance on the text and the book. So I think as we look out into the future, we also have to recognize that not only is it not evenly distributed among kids, it's not evenly distributed among disciplines. And how we approach it can't be a one-size-fits-all thing at this moment of transition. Um, so why is this important? I think it just means that we have to be researchers and scholars about this. We have to be serious about breaking down and segmenting our approaches, um, whether we're thinking about the library or the teaching environment in this 2020 frame. Maybe everything will converge, um, but I'm not convinced that's uh, entirely so. Um, and I think the other piece, just to um, be uh, honest about it, is that it's not just kids who are experiencing this change. Um, we know absolutely that our president carries a Blackberry, right? Um, we all carry it. I still can't get it out of my hand. I don't know why, quite why I'm holding it like this. Um, and of course, we're modeling these behaviors all the time. Um, I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and I realized the other day I was in the um, living room and I was sending an email to my wife who was in the kitchen. I realized, oh my goodness, this is really bad, and this is really modeling for our kids in terms of how they do things. Um, and uh, you know, they are always trying to slap the Blackberry away when it's, uh, when it's in my hand. Um, so I think it's important to break down the divide also along age lines. There are um, absolutely just as many people doing sophisticated work using digital technologies and digital literacies who are on faculties and um, who are in our graduate um, uh, programs. Um, I'm not talking about the downsides of the digital age today, but if you look at problems like privacy, adults are just as dumb as kids in terms of leaving too much information online, particularly on dating sites. I can touch a whole riff on that later, but uh, I think it's important not to sort of fall into the myth of the digital native, the fact that it's only kids who are sophisticated and all the kids are the same. We actually have to be more sophisticated about it than that. Um, this was uh, a, uh, just a further note. Um, it, I cut it off on the bottom just because of where it goes, but it says where the cool kids hang out. This was an image of uh, our president, Barack Obama, when he was at the Harvard Law School um, and he was a big library user, so we uh, <laughs> like to promote, <laughs> promote that on, on the side. Okay, so looking ahead, 
um, that's one set of, uh, of opportunities and challenges is the extent to which um, the digital age has a series of different ways in which kids approach these technologies and adults too. Um, but I think it's super important that we go forward recognizing that uh, no school, not the richest schools um, and not uh, any other schools has more money to deal with these issues than before. We are at a moment where we have to make hard choices and often those hard choices come between the analog and the digital. So um, there are many ways I think in which this plays out, at least in my world in libraries. Um, one of the problems is that we have a split between um, faculty sometimes wanting hard copies of things and students wanting the same things as electronic copies, right? Um, we can't go to publishers and buy both. We don't have the option of getting an increase from our dean or our president of 50% just to buy things in both of these formats. Um, at the same time, of course, publishers are gouging us. I'm sorry if there are any publishers in the room, but they are. Um, there's consolidation and price rises that are way above inflation. Um, we had one of our vendors in the law world who came to us a couple of years ago. It was actually during the horrible downturn year of 2008. Um, and they said, we would like a price increase of 44% for exactly what we gave you last year. So, no, it, it's just it can't work, right? That is a totally unsustainable world. Um, so we have to make hard choices. I think for us at Harvard, our reaction to this has been to say, we have historically had a view that what a library did was to collect everything, the scholarly record as much as possible in physical format and bring it to 02138, our zip code, right? And have it there for researchers. We no longer can afford to do that. Nobody can afford to do that. And I think we have to give up on the idea that libraries are only about huge collections of materials and the only place you can get it and focus instead on a principle of access. A principle that said, our students or our faculty need access to the materials to do their scholarship and their teaching, but we may or may not have it. So it's ILL, interlibrary loan on steroids, right, is the way to think about this. We need lots of ways to be cooperative, to be collaborative in ways that we haven't before. We at Harvard haven't played nicely in all of these respects in the past, um, but we are much more so. Um, but I, I note this just to say, it's the answer here is not just figure out how to do all these new digital things in addition to our um, physical things, the things we've always done. That's not plausible. We have to be honest enough and courageous enough to give up stuff that we've done in the past and replace it with the good stuff while also realizing in the digital age there are new problems that crop up. Digital literacies is a new problem to address in some respects. It's the same uh, teaching of analysis and getting to quality information, but it's something that does require some different skills to teach it well and so forth. So uh, get, this is against a backdrop of uh, a difficulty, I admit, um, financially. Um, another way in which there's a difficulty, I think, in this visioning process is recognizing that the amount of material and the scope of scholarship is only increasing. I'm sure this is true for you or I, I know it's true at Harvard. Um, the two things that the dean of every uh, law school anyway, talks about is how interdisciplinary and how international the faculties are, how global it is, right? These are wonderful, wonderful things for scholarship and wonderful for teaching and wonderful for the world. Um, but the problem is, from a libraries and a teaching perspective, is that means we need more materials, right? We need access to much more. So um, getting access to the burgeoning uh, world of Chinese law in this particular case, um, much less ensuring that across the disciplines we're not dropping balls, that we're not um, not collecting at the interstices between, say, law and social science or um, dentistry and medicine and so forth, these places where so much work is going on, we have to think really differently, I think, about how we collect and how we provide access. So this is yet another pressure, I think, in favor of uh, rethinking uh, from the ground up. Um, and I think adding to this challenge is the fact that we haven't totally figured out our own pathways to learning. I don't think we've figured out all the pathways we want to give students to how they get to information and how they ought to learn. Um, this is really a plea for thinking seriously about how cognition works, how learning works, how we present information. Um, when I came to the Harvard Law School library, I was not a librarian, um, and I had the great, great honor to take on this job, but I had the advantage of being a rookie where you can come in and just ask the really dumb questions. So the first thing I did was I met with each of the 100 people who work in this law library, um, and I just found out what they did. And it turned out at the end of that, with 100 people, how many people do you think were focused on our website, presenting information through the web? One is a great guess. It was one third of one FTE, okay? One third of one FTE, 